Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this diversity, equity, and, inclu and inclusion in conservation practice and research webinar hosted by the Society for Conservation Biology in North America, Student Affairs, and its webinar series. Um, I am Shamaya Bowie, an undergraduate at University of South Florida and also part of the Society for Conservation Biology North America subcommittee um, and your host for today. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to say that you too can get involved with the Society for Conservation Biology by becoming a member um, and just gain all these perks as listed and just get more involved in the conservation biology scene. Um, you can do so by going to the website listed um, and we have hosted previous webinars. You can see them on the SCB North American YouTube YouTube channel and on our website under SCBNA News. Um, and if you want to do what I do, you can also join the subcommittee by emailing Melissa Cronin at the email listed. Um, um, to getting back to our main focus for today, we are going to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and conservation practice in research. Um, and we have invited two fabulous panelists for today to help us discuss and delve more into that topic. Um, and I do ask that if you do have questions, please put them in the chat or hold on to them until the end after our panelists speak, and we'll get to your questions. Um, and now I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists for today. We are going to be having Dr. Paris Stefanides and Ms. Sheena Tama speaking today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Paris Stefanides. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford, currently working with the UK-based non-governmental organization, Ecton. Um, his research has a focus in marine biology my, sorry, marine biodiversity and conservation. He has experience working with nations to ensure research is co-designed and co-produced to benefit all parties involved and produce policy relevant outcomes. He is passionate in um, raising ocean awareness and has contributed to various media um, communications and training programs. And our second speaker is going to be Ms. Sh Sheena Palma, sorry. She is a conservationist and science program manager of Necton Foundation. She is also a marine biologist from the Seychelles and specializes in fisheries and ichthyology. Um, Palma has a passion for generating science within the Seychelles and the Indian Ocean. She is especially interested in education and awareness raising programs that will garner a new generation of marine scientists and enthusiasts. Um, Dr. Paris Stefanides, I'm gonna hand it over to you and you can share your screen. Hi everyone. everyone. Yes, thank you for inviting me, first of all, to present you a little bit about sort of my career path. Um, and I'm going to start sharing my presentations. Uh, okay, now I can. Can you see my presentation in presentation mode? Is that a yes? We're seeing no, the right presenter. now we see yours. Sorry. Presenting mode. Um, we see presenter mode. Is it or it's not? Because I can see it in presenter mode. So let's try that again, maybe. Um, yeah, we could see your screen with your notes and all that sort of stuff. So you might need to switch. Ah, I which see. Ones are being well, okay, got it. So you can see my presentation mode, sort of. Okay, cool. That's better. Great. Um, so 1989, I guess this is where my story starts. Um, so 32 years ago in this, um, well, you could say beautiful city in northern Greece. So this is where I was born and um, where I spent the first sort of 18 years of my life. So during those 18 years, um, bear in mind that my hometown uh, in Greece was terrestrial, so didn't necessarily have a lot of sort of um, connections with the oceans necessarily, other than going to the beach as a kid. Um, so over the first 17 to 18 years, like I guess most teenagers, I was sort of trying to figure, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. Whenever I was talking like to 
you know, grandparents and parents, they all had sort of ideas, you should become perhaps a doctor, or you could become, um, you know, a lawyer, and all these sort of traditional sort of um, professional routes that people think it's the best thing you should be doing. I wasn't necessarily convinced with that. I was sort of interested working with animals. I knew that I had sort of like uh, a great interest in sort of documentaries as a kid. I wasn't necessarily interested, particularly marine biology. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanted, you know, I wanted to study sort of with animals. So my sort of, um, the, the position that I wanted to get to in the university when I first sort of gave my equivalent A-levels, I guess, for some of you, is was to become a vet. I wasn't successful in that, so I ended up becoming, um, you know, um, enrolling in um, in biology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. So there, that was a very sort of broad degree. So I got lessons that um, related to plant, uh, to plants, to animals, to microbes, to all sorts of things. So it was a very broad sort of degree. And my dissertation, and you can see some of the lab members here, and a very young me, um, uh, we were sort of looking at gut contents of fish, but we also, I was focusing specifically, that was more of a side project, I was focusing specifically on the Ctenophora fauna of, of the Mediterranean, these are sort of seacom um, jellies, I think. Um, um, so, you know, I was sort of slowly going to the aquatic slash marine world, but not necessarily there yet. So, you know, by the time I finished my, my bachelor degree, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life, other than that I wanted to continue working in this field. So then I enrolled for a degree and a master's degree in aquatic sciences in UCL. So I moved from Greece to the UK. And, and, and as the name suggests, it was focusing on general aquatic sciences with a specific focus, I would think, more in sort of freshwater and maybe riverine environments. So not still marine. Um, so I was doing, um, you know, going to lots of salt marshes, going to coastal areas, maybe sometimes seeing a lot of macrophages, as you can see here. Uh, and working on zooplankton. So my thesis actually was 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 on zooplankton. Um, but exactly because my sort of bachelor degree and my master's degree was very different to what I'm doing now, I think ultimately this sort of helped me to gain some additional knowledge that I wouldn't have traditionally gotten otherwise. So a lot of sort of peripheral knowledge, which, which helps me even today. Um, so by the time I finished my master's degree, I knew throughout the master's degree that I wanted to continue and I wanted to do a PhD in this case. So I didn't want to work necessarily straight away from my master's, which is what some people do. Um, again, I was applying like hell during the master's um, program to try and find different PhD, um, advertised PhD programs, but um, I managed to find one eventually. Um, but before that, I... I was allowed to do an internship because I also applied for different internship at the Natural History Museum in London. So again, this was sort of focusing on a, on a river in, uh, on a nature in habitat. So we were going on the Thames every, um, every two days. It was super cold, as you can see from all the clothes that we were wearing. It was winter. Um, and, and what we were doing is we were trying to deploy different types of nets. And with those, um, we wanted to essentially release as many eels as possible, as you can see in the middle picture, I'm holding a very slippery eel. It'd be really tricky to get them uh, and try and measure them uh, in order because they were protected. So we didn't want to catch many eels, but at the same time, we also wanted to catch a lot of Chinese mitten crabs, which were invasive, which are invasive on the Thames. Um, so that was a really sort of cool project. One of the skills that I got there, uh, rather sort of unconventionally, is that I learned how to drive. Uh, because um, the, the place where we were going to go every three days was two hours away from, from the Institute. And, um, you know, my, my then supervisors thought that, you know, you're the, you're the young person here, you, you might, you're going to drive. And for me, that was quite a big learning curve because, you know, in, in, in Greece, everyone drives from on the right, while in the UK on the left. So that was my first sort of unexpected, I don't know why it moved, I'm going to move it back, yes, unexpected sort of soft skill that I learned throughout this project. But other than that, of course, I learned how to work on a boat for the first time, even though it was a small boat, and I learned to deploy different gears, such as nets, try to make measurements of fish and crabs, you know, on the field and sort of try and identify. So I sort of developed some taxonomic skills during that project. And then um, and another interesting finding, which was not sort of the aim of the project, but it was very uh, interesting to report it later on the paper, was that we found a lot of plastic sort of and trash on the Thames, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily expect because you couldn't see. That was sort of like the beginning when sort of everyone started reporting plastic in all sort of major uh, marine and non-marine ecosystems. 
So after I finished my internship, then I spent the next three to four years in Southampton. So I did my PhD in deep sea ecology. Um, I specifically work in foraminifera, and you can see them there on the top right, so sort of small sediment dwelling organisms. Um, and I think the PhD, a lot of people sort of, you know, looking at Twitter, sort of, you know, don't necessarily have the best experiences when they do it because it, it can be stressful. Uh, it can be a lot of sort of demanding and you have to do a lot of tasks. I personally probably was one of the lucky ones. I really enjoyed my experience there. So I, um, um, you know, the, the PhD community at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton was quite big. So there were a lot of PhD students there. So there was a strong sense of camaraderie and you know if you had issues you could discuss them with 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 other people and sort of you know complain about the same things and all that nice stuff that happens between people um, and at the same time I developed a huge range of skills that you don't necessarily expect when starting a PhD so I was able obviously I had my own project so I had developed project man management skills I had to meet deadlines so time management skills I had to present my work to my peers and as well as in conferences so I develop you know like I um, oral skills poster presentation skills it moves after a certain while on its own um, yes so um, I learned sort of how to write academically how to communicate my science to non-scientists um, and most importantly that's why I have the pictures here that was uh, my first sort of uh, my first three oceanographic expeditions that was um, fortunate enough to be able to join and that these were on a rather sort of unattractive place in the northeast Atlantic called Porcupine Abyssal Plain which you know the weather is not great but you still get to spend three three weeks on a ship and I was um, able to do that for three times and that gave me definitely sort of a much better like knowledge of of, of you know like how do you collect samples that you're actually working on your PhD um, um, and, and try and sort of um, see how deep sea science is being conducted in, in real time so that was a very sort of valuable training opportunity for me um, and obviously going towards the end of my phd um, i sort of started thinking about what what should my next step be um, again i was not 100 percent sure what i wanted to do with my life and this is a theme throughout my career uh, where i'm not always 100 percent what i want to do next um, and i remember i applied for a position at Nectar, um, which is the, um, the, the institution that I work currently at, and that was associated with the University of Oxford. And I completely, I mean, I stayed st still in the marine sort of realm, but I completely changed subjects. So when I was focusing on, on sort of very deep sea, 5,000 meter uh, habitats with small organisms that you see under the microscope in my PhD, I switched to focusing on coral reefs from shallows, maybe up to 300 meters deep, in tropical and subtropical locations. So that was a, um, a steep learning curve for me in the first maybe probably two years, I would say, until I became sort of confident that, you know, like I was sort of slowly becoming an expert in that field, but in the beginning, I wasn't. So uh, I guess the reason why I'm sort of focusing specifically on that is because sometimes people think that when you sort of, you know, do something um, at, at any given point in your life, you should be actually doing this for the rest of your life, which is great if you can somehow manage and do that. But in most cases, you will not be able necessarily to do that. So it's a bit, it's not bad to be a little bit flexible. Um, I'm not saying that you should jump from marine and sort of study terrestrial microbes, but um, as long as it's sort of more or less related to what you do, it's not actually a bad thing to try and do something a little bit different because you get extra. Okay, the presentation has a life on its own. Yeah, so you get sort of like some additional skills and sort of more broader knowledge, which can be useful as well sometimes. So in terms of the science that I'm doing, Throughout my postdoctoral position now, it's um, we are looking at coral reef biodiversity and connectivity with depth. So we have been working in Bermuda, as well as Seychelles and Comores, uh, and you can see here um, some of the people involved. Like in the middle, it's it's Jerome Harley, who's from the University of Seychelles, and then Molly Rivers. She used to be um, the laboratory manager of Nectar. Um, and apart from the science that we do um, at Nectar at the University of Oxford, we also do a lot of outreach and education. So you can see. Uh, one example here on the left, you, you know, you, you get to do a lot of talks and, and scientific conferences, uh, but then we also have quite um, strong links with media, 
uh, during the Seychelles expedition in 2019, for example, we had Associated Press on board and Sky News. So there were opportunities to try and communicate your science in a non-scientific sort of language to much broader audiences, which I think is really important. Um, and then uh, we also, uh, you can see here on the right, Lucy Woodle, when she was talking, and uh, you can't see it, but I'm telling you that she was talking like to schools uh, online. So that was also sort of trying to engage the next generation of, of, of researchers, I guess. Um, I'm getting close to the end. Um, policy outputs, um, uh, I particularly sort of put this picture here of the uh, former president of Seychelles um, because he came on board and that is um, another sort of thing that I'm really interested in doing is trying to create data sets that somehow will inform policymakers to make better decisions when it comes to spatial management of, of their marine resources. We don't, we're not a policy advocate organization, but, but we want to get information there to policymakers so that they're able to sort of do more informed decisions. And another thing that we are really sort of keen and really sort of um, passionate about is trying to do more collaborative science. Um, so we wrote some papers related to that, sort of how to avoid parachute science practices, which is, for example, when someone like me uh, from a sort of um, high income nation like the UK conducts research in another, in another location, and then I don't necessarily engage with them. So this is called parachute science, and it has many negative benefits, uh, so not benefits, many um, negative consequences, as well as for me, as well as for the people who actually are on the receiving end of it. Um, so we um, uh, also published a paper where we try and sort of give an example of how the space expedition worked and some positive sort of steps that we have taken and that other researchers might take as well if they want to conduct more collaborative science. Um, I, and this is just a picture because it, it was really cool when we were on the expedition uh, in Seychelles. Um, but before I finish, I think this is what people probably think is everyday life at work for someone who works maybe like in marine science. That's actually not the case. So what I want to sort of show you is this is the timeline of a project, in this case, the Seychelles project from 2018 to 2021. And these are the different steps involved in a project. So the first one, uh, we're going, hmm. right, okay, okay, yeah. So for example, the first step of the project is always establishing partnerships and I put sort of a timeline below. So that can take a couple of months at the very beginning of the project. Then, uh, must be me doing something sorry guys um, then the next step is of course the planning process which can take a couple of months so that took like all the way from october to march 2019 the actual field phase which is sort of associated with that picture here of being a submersible only takes two months so from a three-year project the actual field phase might take one and a half to two months so it's not like you will always be on a submersible or doing sort of these cool things. Then taxonomic consultation is where you try and identify all the things you have in your footage that you have collected in this case. So that can take a couple of months. And then the actual data collection, which is probably the, 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 the biggest sort of uh, step, can take more than a year. And then you have other smaller steps, which is the data analysis, dissemination, publication, and open access and data curation. So this is more like that you get an idea of what actually a project looks like and how much time you get spent at sea. Uh, and obviously during COVID, you can't do that even, uh, but this is um, the, the field phase for that one was before COVID. Um, before I finish two more slides, I know I'm sort of slightly running over time. Other professional activities that I have been trying to do throughout my, uh, my career, which I think were really beneficial, um, is when I was doing a PhD, I was helping organizing some marine life talks. They were aimed at, uh, at non-scientists uh, and I think trying to get involved in those in those sorts of activities can be really beneficial because that one, for example, allowed me to talk to other researchers, try and convince them very much similar to what you guys have been doing with me, for example, here, try and invite speakers and, you know, you, you get organization skills, you get networking skills, uh, and you also do public engagement. Um, I was for six years a trustee of the Deep Sea Biology Society, so that's a volunteer sort of like position where I was doing all sorts of different things that the society does for the deep sea community. So that was also really beneficial. And I developed a lot of soft skills that, um, you know, necessarily you wouldn't know when you were doing them at that specific moment where they were going to help you. But ultimately, at some point later on, you realize, ah, okay, that skill that I developed when I was a trustee, for example, I was managing the website, 
that has helped me, you know, managing the website in my current position where I'm at, for example. Oh, no, no, not yet. Um, and then another one, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, which is another working group that I recently joined. So all these sort of extra, uh, you know, outside of your normal working duties, if, if you can do those of them, if you have time, of course, because I realize some, that some people don't have necessarily the luxury of doing all those extra activities, uh, it's they, they can definitely help you. Uh, and you also do good to the wider community that you're representing. And uh, perhaps finally is that, uh, you know, you should also be having non-professional activities as well. I think what kept me sane throughout my life is that I had a lot of sort of extra curricular sort of activities that were not related to work where I could sort of completely switch off. I mean, I particularly enjoy playing football, um, but you know, you, you might be doing completely different things. It might be writing music, um, you know, in, in a room like my wife does, but it could be any, anything that you particularly like. And it, it sort of gets your mind away from work, which is really important. Otherwise, you know, you'll go crazy. Uh, and you know, 2021 and forwards, I still sort of trying to figure out my path. I sort of know better where I am, but I, I guess, my message is it's not bad necessarily to not know what, what you want to do as the next step in your life. I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, um, Dr. Perrin Sofanidis, for that amazing presentation. That was awesome. <laughs> um, and we'll now bring it over to Sheena Palma for hers. If you want to share your screen. Great, thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully um, my presentation doesn't have a mind of its own. Um, but let's see. So yeah, once again, thank you for having uh, both Paris and I. It's a pleasure to share kind of our story. Um, I'm assuming that now you can see my presentation. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, my own personal journey, and then we can lead into that conversation um, about inclusivity, et cetera. So I like to think of my journey um, to the deep sea, um, similar to how a water uh, stream moves from the mountaintops to the ocean. So um, like Shania said, I'm from the Seychelles Islands. And if anyone doesn't know where that is, it's off the east coast of Africa, and it's a group of islands distributed between um, four and 10 degrees south of the equator, which means that it's got tropical weather. It's quite hot and uh, generally lovely weather. So if anyone wants to come visit, um, it's a great place to be. Um, but we have two different types of islands. Uh, we have granitic islands, which means they're really high and they have these beautiful mountains. Um, so they're very different to the to like Hawaii and stuff because they're not made of volcanic action, right? And the Coraline Islands, which are these flat islands, what do you think of when you think of the Maldives? Um, but we're quite well known for our, the biggest nut in the world, which is the Coco de Mer. Um, and basically this nut can reach 25 kilograms um, and the tree itself takes about 25 years before it can reproduce. Um, so that's our kind of claim to fame. We also have a whole host of different species um, of plants that are endemic to this area. And we only have one endemic mammal, which is maybe a surprise for many if I tell you that I was actually obsessed with polar bears and wolves as a, as a child. So nothing marine related. Um, and this is probably because my, the image I had or what I aspired to be was Pocahontas you know, have these pet animals and speak to uh, the wind, etc. cetera. Um, so that's kind of, you know, thinking about now and how things have changed. A lot of Islanders have, especially little kids have Moana and something that they look forward to and learn about ocean stewardship. So how is the media important in how um, we portray ourselves and um, essentially as a mentor in our very early stages? So a lot of my time as a kid was actually spent in, um, at the foot of these mountains where I lived um, and in my backyard were actually lots of frogs. So this is where I 
became interested with the natural world. Um, yes, the beach was close by, it was about 15 minutes away, but you know, that was spent, uh, we spent the beach, uh, we spent time on the beach during the weekends or, you know, fishing with our grandparents, but generally only like once or twice a week. So this is why I spent most of my time kind of observing um, the things I could see in my backyard, which generally was frogs. And I <laughs> developed another obsession with them, killed quite a few along the way, um, trying to get the tadpoles to become frogs, but forgetting to take the cap off the, off the jar, for example. Um, and like a river, um, my journey moved and my interests moved from these frogs to then the plateau. When I was about 16, I started working on an island, uh, one of the islands, a private island, um, as a conservation assistant. So I used to talk to guests and tell them about the great stuff that we could see and turtles and tortoises, etc. cetera. Um, and I became really interested in this part of, of our, our ecosystem. But again, you know, things change and you develop more interests. Um, so every holiday I would work on this island and one of my newer mentors was this lovely lady called Linda who really kind of um, pushed me to be uh, more academic or, you know, take a, a bigger interest in maybe pursuing a university course um, once I was done with my high school. So here um, I actually then, you know, switched gears and developed a new obsession with turtles and learning about, you know, their habits and learning um, the, the very core of, of science, collecting data, analyzing data, cleaning data. So this is where my first actual interactions with what it means to be a scientist began. So when I actually got immersed in the ocean is when I was 18, still working on the island every holiday. And they had a policy that if you were there, you could, you could die for free. So um, I had this amazing instructor and he took me down. Now, the reason this took so long is because as a kid, I was actually quite scared of the water because I nearly drowned. And um, for some reason that experience kind of lives with you. So um, it was a huge leap. Uh, for me to be able to, you know, take that next step and explore the ocean. Now, one thing that I still remember of my first dive is the fear, number one, but then the extreme curiosity. And um, one of the things that I've learned is that curiosity um, can lead to bigger things. Um, and this led to why I studied ichthyology and fishery science, which is just a fancy name for fish. Ichthyology is, you know, fancy name for fish. And I was what, the first graduate from my family to actually go to university um, on scholarships and worked all the way through extra jobs to pay for my master's and also, you know, had scholarships all along the way. So, um, so I was really privileged to be one of those people to be able to, to get a scholarship and really fight for a scholarship as well. Um, so in my undergraduate years, my first three years at university, and I went to university in South Africa because we didn't have a university in Seychelles at the time, um, I wanted to study everything. So I did zoology, botany, entomology, all the ologies you can think of. Um, I kind of, you know, dabbled in it and found out what I loved and um, decided that the best thing for me was to pursue a BSc honors, which is one year in ichthyology and fishery science. Now, the reason for that is because again, the mentors, the people in your immediate surrounding kind of believe in you and um, they make you think outside of the box. Now, the things we were talking about in our classes were things like, do fish feel pain or are fish altruistic or, um, you know, can fish fly? And these kind of questions got your mind um, going and made, made class interesting. Um, and one of the projects that I did, my first thesis, um, 
in my BSc honors was um, on black tip leaf sharks and understanding their movement patterns using acoustic tagging. I didn't do any of the tagging. I didn't do any of the field work. I was just there churning out on the desktop. So, you know, like Paris said, you think that a marine biologist is out in the water all the time, but sometimes you just get a set of data and you work on it. And, and that's sometimes what science is, but it's still interesting. And the reason I loved it so much is because it was in my own backyard, in my ocean, the Indian Ocean. And that was one of my kind of requisites to why I would study further. Um, it's only if I can do a project that will contribute um, to the learnings of the country I was in or the region. So then I did my MSc, which is probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. We do an MSc by research and it took longer than I thought. Um, it was meant to take two years. It took more than three and a half years, but I learned so much. And I did it on a topic that I absolutely hated. You can see me here in this lab coat and it was genetics. And it's just a different way of thinking. But the reason I did it is because I knew it would challenge me and I knew it would be hard. And a lot of opportunities and doors opened um, by persevering through um, that hardship. Um, and you know, straight out of university, I went back, came back here to the Seychelles because I wanted to contribute uh, to the country um, and started working with the Seychelles government, which is where Nectin comes along and where I first met Paris in 2018. And they were starting off the stakeholder process. So I got the dossier for Nectin and I was, kind of told to, you know, make sure they're okay and um, take them around and make sure they introduce the right people and let's see what the research agenda is like, et cetera. Because the whole idea was to collaborate and create a, a piece of science that both parties would be happy with. Um, and Paris spoke a bit about this as well, you know, not participating in parachute science, which as an Islander, I am very well versed with. Um, so, some of the highlights, of course, as Paris said, is um, diving in a submersible. But again, this is only a small portion of the time. And um, as a Seychellois, um, being able to see my own backyard, so that's how I like to think of the ocean, um, our deep sea is, mesmerizing. Um, the manta ray in this we didn't actually see because we were concentrating so much on trying to get the right data. We only saw it afterwards. Um, but being able to see the different fish species, especially as an ichthyologist um, who was privy to seeing a lot of dead fish, but not necessarily live ones. Um, and I promise I'm not bored here. We're just really concentrating. That's my concentration base. Um, and being able to dive to areas where, you know, most people haven't been is, wasn't just a privilege, but it's also um, a boost that essentially will, you know, live in my memory forever, but it also motivates you to do more for the ocean um, that we all depend on. So just a little bit of footage, what that looks like going from 10 meters, something that, you know, a lot of people, if you snorkel or dive, you're used to seeing. Um, and I like to think of this as different cities. So this is like New York City, really busy. Um, and then as we go down to 30 to 60 meters, it's like going towards the outskirts of the city uh, where it becomes a little more quiet, uh, but there's still a lot of life and what's going on. Um, and what is interesting is how the structures change and how the light changes and the species that live there. And then as you go down to 120 meters, it becomes darker. Um, and you know the structures are completely different. You don't see those hard corals um, and you need special equipment to get here, or you, or you have to be a special kind of diver. Um, and once you reach 250 to 300 meters, um, absolutely no light. And, um, you know, it just kind of inspires, but also um, really shows you that there's so much to learn about the ocean that surrounds us. So that's 
one of the big projects I work on, and as a cons consultant, I work um, with Necton primarily, but there are other things that I do. For example, I am involved in some science projects. Um, one of this was the Aldabra Cleanup Project, where we raised the, our own funding. We raised about 150,000 um, pounds. And we went to this remote island, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's kind of like the Galapagos of the Seychelles, of the Indian Ocean even. Um, and we managed to remove 25 tons of plastic. Now this plastic is coming from all over the world. It's not produced by the Seychelles. It's coming out of rivers and being spat into the ocean and being washed up on shores very far away. And it's just another way to illustrate how connected we all are. Um, Although I hate genetics, I am still involved in some projects uh, because it is such an important skill and it's really powerful. Um, so we're trying to barcode some fish larvae and eggs, barcode basically, you know, sequence it and find out what kind of species it is genetically, because it's really hard to identify them um, just morphologically. Um, and some other projects that I'm involved in is trying to create a sustainability um, labeling initiative for the Seychelles. Small island states and coastal countries depend on fisheries as, a, a, as an important source of protein. But how do we do that sustainably? Um, and there are these initiatives that exist in bigger countries. Can something like this be created for a small island state with such high dependency on protein from fish? So after all that ranting, what have I learned? and uh, how can we all use um, each other's lessons, right? So the first thing I learned is perseverance. Um, I many times was in tears whilst doing my master's because I just felt like, you know, you can't do it, it's just too hard, but you have to persevere through those things and learn a lesson from them. Um, humility, when I came back from university and went into government, you know, the one thing I wanted to do was really try and change um, some of our policies and things like that. But what I quickly learned is that one person cannot change everything and be a little more humble. And essentially, I learned that, you know, to build a house, we all need to put bricks. And maybe one of the bricks that you put will contribute to building that house. Um, apply, apply for everything, especially if you're interested in it, um, especially some of the scholarships that I got when I was in my master's, like the Mandela Rhodes Foundation Scholarship. Um, you know, for me, I thought I'd never get that because it's, you know, it was up there and something that I kind of put on a pedestal, um, but apply for it. You never know what will happen. Um, and people, people need to be part of the decisions that we make when we're doing science. Um, and that doesn't matter what field you're in, uh, but especially when we're thinking about protected areas and conservation and inequality. There is so much inequality and so many systemic issues that still exist, um, but we have to change that one step at a time. And if that means that you can change it within the science field that you're in, um, then do that. Uh, and on that note, I will be happy to receive questions. Thank you so much panelists for your amazing presentations. Um, we will now take the floor for questions um, from our audience. If anyone does have any questions, you can utilize the reactions button at the bottom and use the raise your hand feature. Um, you can also unmute yourself or you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, so I guess while people are getting geared up with questions, I can ask a question um, for the both of you. When did you notice that there is a need to address um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in conservation. Do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I can go first. Um, so one of the things about living on a small island with 90,000 people is that you are very um, protected, I would say. So I was quite protected growing up, um, you know, to inequalities, et cetera. Um, but living, I lived a little bit in Kenya, which really opened my eyes to those inequalities. And then I lived in South Africa um, with, you know, a historic 
background of discrimination uh, based on people of color and race, et cetera. So um, I think the first time it actually hit me was in South Africa. Um, and you know, it, it, one of the great things is that there was this open community where we could talk especially within our department about how we need to change um, so certain systems that will allow our sciences to be more inclusive, um, especially within ichthyology. It was male dominated and um, white dominated. Um, so, you know, it was really, that was the first time where I really had those open conversations and, um, you know, opened my eyes to, to the real world and how we can contribute towards changing it. Yeah, from my side, I guess um, I wasn't, you know, aware of, of a lot of the sort of DI issues up until I started working on international projects, because most of the stuff that I've been doing up until my PhD, it was sort of within the UK sort of remit. Uh, and I guess other than being, you know, from Greece and working in the UK, I didn't face any sorts of discrimination. So I was quite protected from that in a way. So I started sort of thinking about those issues, you know, working with Mecton and international projects like the one in Bermuda and then following that on uh, with Seychelles, Comores and other locations. And this is where I sort of, this was quite a steep learning curve for me because I guess what happens with a lot of people is you might not necessarily have bad intentions of, you know, not doing the, you know, something in the correct and proper way, but you might do it regardless because you're not sort of educated, you're not sort of, um, you're not aware of what might cause harm or what might be actual sort of a non, you know, a parachute sort of like attitude, if, if you like. And that sort of comes all the way back from what you're being taught at the university, that, uh, for example, in coral reef science, it's really common for people to actually do, for example, uh, paid internships in island nations, and then they collect data and then they sort of jump off and then do the research uh, back at home. So this is something that you get taught to as, as, a, as an undergraduate, that it's quite okay to do that. So I'm not saying that I'm, I'm excusing those people, but it's, it's sometimes you have to get trained to those things. And I think the fact that we sort of start discussing those things is, 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 is a good step forward. But I definitely sort of got more aware of these being able to participate in international projects work with people like Sheena, sort of try to see their point of view and, you know, like exchange ideas, I guess, uh, and try and see, um, you know, the world, if you like, from, from, from the point of view of someone else, I guess. Yes, for sure. I, I hope that going into conservation, oh, Matt has a question, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, you guys have such a varied background as you work through the various steps um, of your formal educations, but also, Sheena, you were talking about, you know, your informal education growing up in the Seychelles. Were there particular strategies that you guys used to convince those in charge of your next step, whether it was going from ba bachelor's to master's, master's to PhD, were there particular strategies that you guys found useful to convince those individuals to take you on, given that your background was not directly in line with what that next step was? I can go first on that one. I guess, um, well, I mean, going from bachelor to master's didn't matter that much because I think it's, it's really open-ended what you can do once you have a bachelor degree. If you had a degree in biology, you pretty much can do anything for a master. So I didn't need to convince anyone other than, you know, like showing my grades, I guess. Um, for the internship, I really, I mean, the strategy was to actually put yourself forward and, you know, try and talk to people, even if it sounds intimidating just send that email meet them in person in a conference because that's how i found my internship i sort of saw them in a conference and then i sort of reached out to them uh, and explained what i wanted to do it you would be surprised i mean that that's not a guarantee but you would be surprised that you know like how much you can achieve just by doing that and then for my phd i guess again it was something out of my field and for the for the poster position as well but i sort of like applied for it and i made the case for myself because if i don't do it who will uh and and it you know like in many cases you will do that and you will fail i'm not saying that every time you will be successful um but you know every now and then you are successful that's part of science you know like one out of ten if you are successful that's quite good that's a quite a good ratio for me 
Yeah, and I think to add on to Paris, I mean, my kind of fight to go to university um, started, well, you know, once I realized that it's something that I could do. So it was a fight with myself, firstly, to, you know, to actually think that you can actually go to university. It was kind of a big deal here. Um, and then because you have to leave the country, right? So it's not like it's just a school down the road. Um, and the second was actually getting a scholarship. I mean, that was a fight on its own. My parents um, ad advocated literally with the um, human resources department here in Seychelles because they give scholarships out, but marine biology or ichthyology wasn't on the list as something important at the time. Um, so, you know, they fought and they saw as many people as possible so that I could actually get a scholarship. And even then I got half a scholarship and the other half came from the place where I'd worked on at ever since I was 16 until I was 21. You know, the fight never stops, but if you really want something, then you, you kind of have mentors and people who can push you in that direction. And I'm lucky to have had that. There are lots of people who don't have those mentors. Um, so, you know, it puts us in that position of privilege where we've gone through something and maybe we can be a mentor for someone else. Um, at university itself, I was like an eager student. I mean, I had five years worth of data when I was in my third year with regards to sea turtle hatchling because I'd been working on this island for so long. And one of the reasons I didn't do zoology further was because my, my supervisor was like, you only need a month worth of data and really discouraged, you know, that like drive, which is why I switched departments altogether. Um, and, you know, and that was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made to pursue a different direction, one that I didn't think I'd want to go into um, and yeah, take up theology with a supervisor that was involved and um, was happy to kind of find projects that was focused within the Indian Ocean and kind of not just, you know, listen to his students, but then provide for that student. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's a bit of uh, fortune, but sometimes it's a bit of fighting through a system. Can I add something final on that that might um, help as well is let's assume that I want to apply for a position now that is on sea turtles, for example, which is something that I haven't done before. So the way to convince the, my prospective boss would be to try and make the case that you know a lot of a lot of the skills needed to sort of um, do a research project are not necessarily related to the sea turtle itself. It would be like how did you do the stats? How you do the product project management? How would you sort of collaborate with others? And these are skills that you already have obtained before. So making the case that you know I have developed those skills, and actually if you if you if you've managed to already be successful in a project that you didn't have experience before, but you still managed to deliver, that's a quite a good sort of like, you know, um, bracket that you can do it. Uh, and then a lot of the actual nitty gritty of, of, of the detail of the project, you can learn as, as you go along, unless of course, it's something that's completely out of your field. And then of course, then it might not be a good idea, but um, um, yeah, I think that's how we do it. Sort of emphasize my strengths and skills that are developed, which are sometimes universally you can use them like in different projects, not just in, in one type of project. Awesome, thank you. Okay, then another question that I have is on, um, what do you think be the best way to address our goal after DEI in conservation, like to make positive changes in the future, whether you're in conservation or just wanting to go into it. Do you want to go, Sheena? First. I can start. Yeah, I can start for sure. Um, I mean, some of the, um, I mean, it's a big question, right? Because you're battling against a system and not necessarily um, one person. It's a preconceived bias in some cases. Um, so first and foremost, like I said before, it's sometimes about laying bricks. Uh, you, 
you cannot take on everything. <laughs> that is just the truth. Um, so how do we lay those bricks and that foundation so that change can happen um, and happen at a pace where at least you can see those change, changes um, in, our, in our community. Um, so Paris uh, and myself and some other co-authors wrote a paper um, and Paris was leading on this with regards to um, parachute science in coral reefs uh, ecosystems. And um, in the paper, we kind of give some, some ideas in how to um, ensure that you're collaborative. But I think at the core of it, it's about being respectful, right? And um, just like you would be respectful towards a friend or a partner, it's the same when you have a research partnership or collaboration. Um, the kind of actions that you take and how you, how you approach the topic and ensuring that there is inclusivity and that there isn't a power imbalance is really important. And I think the more we can um, talk about those, these issues, you know, let's not ignore it, it happens. Um, how do we talk about it and bring it more to light, create that awareness. Um, and that is perhaps one of the first bricks that we can lay. And then after that, you know, creating awareness is never enough. We have to then back it up by steps. Um, and that, you know, there's lots of different ways we can do that. Um, funding bodies have a big role to play, um, especially if they're funding research in overseas territories. How can these funding bodies ensure that um, it, they aren't practicing parachute science, for example? Um, yeah, and I mean, I'll stop talking now and hand over to Paris, and then we can see if there's anything else. No, oh, I echo a lot of your points. I guess talking about it is the first step, which probably was not happening in the last couple of years, but sort of like a new phenomenon, if you like, probably propagated with the use of social media. People start talking about these things much easier. They have different platforms to be able to talk about these things, while in the past probably you wouldn't be able to do that very easily. Um, then trying, you know, education is another, another important thing, and that probably comes from a very young age all the way up to, you know, university degrees and how they're being taught and what sort of examples they're, you know, they're setting to new sort of researchers. And then, of course, actions. And I guess that will depend on the level of the individual concerned. For, for example, you can do stuff at, at, at your own sort of individual level. You, you can try and educate yourself. You can try and be more just. You can try to be more inclusive. Then at the sort of higher level would be the, the next one would probably be the group level. You know, like if you're working on a research group to try and sort of have those discussions, try and sort of actively be collaborative and non-exclusive. Uh, and, and then the more tricky sort of upper levels which which go at the institution level which are much more difficult to sort of change but I guess there are always for example at my university there are um, specific groups dealing with those matters so if, if you're if someone is interested they can join those groups and then you know there is a power in numbers and then you can make suggestions you can change specific actions that might not be equitable enough or uh, that might promote diversity um, and then when it comes to trying you know convince even higher level sort of institutions, for example, funding bodies or like, um, you know, treaties at the global level, I guess this is where you should be joining international research groups or like depending on what your field of expertise is and sort of try and raise those issues. Have, For example, you could have specific workshops or um, special sessions or in conferences where, you know, like the, the platform for, for, for sort of hearing those things is, is, is much bigger. Um, yeah, some thoughts from me. Yeah, and sorry, Paris, and I think to add on to that is representation. Um, and, you know, and one of the important parts of uh, the organization that we both work for is ensuring that um, we highlight voices, especially with the countries that we work in. It's not about next and going in and doing all this great stuff. It's about, you know, the scientists that were, were part of it and um, their diverse backgrounds. And how do we make that representation happen? Um, how do you highlight voices that are not necessarily the status quo? Um, so how do we change that and address that narrative? And I think that's one of the the big steps. Like I said, when I was growing up, I had Pocahontas and probably Esmeralda. <laughs> and, you know, and now a lot of kids look at Moana, my cousin's obsessed with it. 
Um, so, you know, it's a clear example of how certain things kind of ingrain in your memory, even as a child. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess before our time runs out for today, I have one more question. Um, I forgot and skipped over it, but why do you think DEI is important? I can say from my sort of perspective, um, if I think if, okay, that's a, that's a difficult question because obviously there are a lot of sort of different aspects to it, but if from a, from a science point of view, um, being able to have, you know, diverse voices and, you know, like you've seen like the background, my background and compared to Sheena's background, it's completely different, but, um, there is strength in having different backgrounds in the sense that when, when it comes to actually do the science, you will learn from each other. The actual sort of um, outputs of the science that you do is, is, is much stronger because you're aware you have different sensitivities, you have different priorities. And I think what usually happens with a lot of scientists from the global north try and conduct science in the global south is that they have their own sets of priorities, which as noble as they might be. And, you know, even if the... Um, I forgot the word, but even if you want to do something in, in a, you know, like and you think it's right, you might not be necessarily aware of, of the conditions, the local conditions where you want to work with. So, for example, people keep advocating about marine protected areas, which I'm a big advocate of as well. But it's it's very different of, you know, like when, when you go and suggest a specific area to be protected, for example, you have to talk with people who actually live there, see sort of some of their point of view because they actually live there how do they use the, that particular area is it necessary for their survival and all that sort of um, all those sorts of thoughts so i guess having diversity actually produces much better science for everyone and it does not create inequalities because a lot of the consequences can be really harmful for, for people who actually live on those particular areas even though maybe the you know the original concept was not bad it actually ends up happening Yeah, I think Paris really touched on some of those big points. And um, like he said, essentially diversity is key. I mean, if we don't live in a, you know, only one type of species of trees everywhere that we're surrounded by, right? The species around us themselves are different and we each have a different type of role and a different type of perspective. Um, and I think that's, that's the key is the fact from a science perspective. Um, is the fact that diverse voices are important uh, because we don't live in a monotone world. We live in a diverse world and we need to um, not just recognize that, but also, you know, learn from the natural environment that we live in. Um, yeah, I think Paris really touched on some, some, some great points there. And um, I think the whole, it's a really difficult question, but the whole idea that we even have to advocate as to why diversity is important is the problem, right? Because that comes, comes from a historical um, systemic issue. Um, and I think that's where our problem lies, the fact that we have to advocate for it. And um, the more that we can talk about those issues, the more that we can bring it to light and the more that we can come up with solutions towards changing those mindsets because that's what it is it's changing the mindsets so that we can cohesively exist um, and learn from each other um, i learned tons from paris um, and i hope he learns from me as well but you know it's that knowledge exchange um, and yeah that's a really hard question though Shamia. <laughs> hopefully we'll all have some more answers for that question soon. Um, seeing some positive changes in conservation as well. Um, it seems like our time is running out for today. Um, well, this was a very informative webinar and um, I would just like to say thank you for our panelists for joining us today to speak about this topic and take time out of your busy days. Um, and I'll also like to thank Megan for helping host this and my lovely co-host Krista for helping me um, and the audience for joining us today and asking me questions. Um, and just thank you so much um, for this webinar.
Um, then I guess this is the end of our webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Shamia. Thank you.